Good morning and thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Ralph Allen and I'm a director at Exec Live. I will be facilitating today's online event and for your reassurance, you are muted. I've had a sneak preview of today's presentation and I'm sure that you will have a lot to take away from this and in all likelihood you will have plenty of questions to ask during the Q&A session. Our main speaker today is Mike Chesson. Mike is Director of Sales for Industrial and Commercial Energy and Services at British Gas. Mike has over 25 years experience working in the energy services business and was responsible for designing and implementing the first central government EPC with the Home Office. He is also a long-term advocate of promoting efficient energy use and as such has consistently developed new ideas and mechanisms to reduce carbon emissions and energy costs throughout his career. Before I hand you over to Mike, I would like to spend a few minutes of your time talking through the key findings of our survey run under our research division, Exec Survey. The survey, which ran in partnership with British Gas, looked at current thinking around energy usage. I understand there are individuals attending this event who have taken part in the survey, and I would like to take the opportunity now to thank you for your contribution. If I may, let me start by providing some background to the survey. We conducted the survey online in November and December last year, and it was completed by 131 senior managers, directors, and C-suite executives. This group represented a broad range of organizations from the manufacturing, finance, transport, and retail industries. Our survey examined the role energy has to play for businesses striving to deliver services in a challenging economic environment. We sought opinions on topics ranging from energy strategies through to current attitudes to government initiatives such as the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme and Climate Change Levy. And finally, the priorities placed on energy and carbon reduction assets. From the survey, I'd like to highlight the following to you today. However, I would encourage you to read the report to get a full overview of the findings. 36% of participants told us they have an advanced energy strategy. A further 48% have one in development, and 8% would like support in its creation. 72% of participants told us they plan to review their company's energy strategy within one to two years. Interestingly, 79% of those who took part also told us that their organization's energy plans have the explicit backing and support from senior management. When asked what best describes the role of energy in their organization, 50% of participants told us that the majority of spend goes on powering machinery and equipment. Just 8% told us energy spend goes on servicing customers and clients, as well as powering machinery and equipment. However, just under a quarter of participants said the main role of energy in their organization was to power, for example, lighting, computers, and heating, so as to enable staff to conduct their job effectively and in comfort. When asked how interested participants were in energy-related issues, the majority were very interested in reducing their carbon footprint. This was followed by getting the right technology to reduce energy usage and the need to be seen to be green. The area of least interest concerned the investigation of the availability of finance for green measures, with over a quarter telling us they were not interested in this issue. To add, 85% of participants had told us that they were very or somewhat interested in the business case for green measures. Payback on implementing green energy measures was too long term, according to 58% of those surveyed, and as such was the biggest barrier to implementing green measures. This was followed by a lack of funding to implement the same measures. However, just 10% felt that the cost was too insignificant to matter. Over half of those surveyed told us that government mandated regulation, such as the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme and the Climate Change Levy, was frustrating, but that it does force good practice on large organizations. I hope you have found some of these findings informative, and if you have not yet had sight of this report, you can download a personal copy from the handout section of the control panel. Alternatively, we will share a copy of the report alongside a recording of this session shortly after the event. I will now hand you over to Mike Chesson, who will talk you through his thoughts on the current landscape. He will also consider solutions organizations have put in place to meet the challenges highlighted in our research. Thanks, Ralph. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me today for this webinar. Today, I'm going to be talking about distributed energy and power and how the energy market is changing and evolving over time and how important that 
maybe to industrial and commercial businesses and indeed residential people over, over time. So if we start on the survey, the findings that were found in that survey were very, very common amongst UK businesses and certainly in my 25 year career, the common themes that occur and are reiterated during that survey really make it clear that nothing much has changed uh, from a business perspective over, over those years where in manufacturing, finance, retail, everybody wants safe energy, secure energy, and it, it needs to be cost effective, which is why many organizations have huge procurement teams that go out and try and procure the cheapest rate they can for their energy. And of course, that gives them that competitive edge if they've got a lower price than, than, than a competitive company. So in British Gas Business, we've helped many businesses who've faced difficulty in, in controlling that energy use and also seeing how they can reduce costs. And it's definitely clear to say that for every industrial and commercial business, everything is always slightly different and everyone has a slightly different estate and a slightly different problem. And we've even looked at our own estate and we've certainly found that to be the case um, there. And we, we've done many, many measures um, from an energy efficiency perspective and from a generation perspective over the years. So we've got a lot of experience and we've done a huge amount in the public sector and the private sector about energy efficiency and energy strategies and technologies and how we can help ourselves and help UK businesses take this forward. And as the energy market is changing, what, what we found is, is that the very things that are difficult for many UK businesses to stomach when it comes to energy efficiency, which is very much reiterated in the report, that getting financing, getting paybacks, all of those type of things to be quick enough to warrant that investment is very difficult, particularly in the private sector, where of course payback is, is really essential to make it as quick as possible. So because of the emerging energy market, we've looked at this and our strategic aims as Centrica and, and British Gas Business is to move ourselves forward into what is now called our distributed energy and power business. And this is certainly looking at the long-term strategic changes that are going to happen with, within the UK energy market. It will give everyone the opportunity to not only save energy costs, but actually flip the model slightly to make what was looked at as a cost in the past actually to be an opportunity to, to make energy revenue income. And that's quite exciting because those paybacks I spoke about are going to change and they will come down as a result of this. So it's quite exciting times, but against the backdrop of the energy market changing significantly in the UK. So I want to talk a bit now about the UK energy landscape. And what you can see on this slide on the right hand side is, is, is the energy trilemma. And that is where UK businesses want to of course reduce energy costs and create revenue streams if they can. They want to reduce carbon emissions and also make sure that the lights stay on. So the security of supply into those sites is, is very resilient and, and improved over time. And what you can see that is happening in the UK energy market, certainly in the last couple of years, but, but will accelerate in the next 10, 15, 20 years, is that if we go back to the beginning of how the UK distributed network for electricity was designed, it was designed around large power stations that were built all around the UK. And that would constitute coal and then gas and then nuclear as time has evolved. Now, Many of us who read the news and see it, it's, it's, it's headlines all the time that, that coal is of course frowned upon because of the carbon emissions, so our coal power stations are being very much uh, changed over to gas over time um, or switched off. Nuclear hasn't been invested in for a while and there is aims to get more nuclear, but of course again the headlines suggest that's not going to happen quickly. So the way in which our power has been generated is changing. And then you overlay on that the fact that in the UK we have put an incredible amount of solar yeah, into the network and also a lot of wind which means that nowadays if it's a really sunny windy day in the middle of summer we have too much energy in this country and therefore a lot of that energy that's generated through renewable sources is actually lost and, and never actually makes it onto grid. You have the converse basically in the winter in that 
if the sun is not shining and the wind doesn't blow, we have limited generation. And you can see from the slide that it is expected that the capacity in this winter coming up, 16, 17, that there will be no spare capacity this winter. And that is quite frightening. And so many companies are now looking at ways in which they can generate their own electricity and therefore make themselves more resilient. But there's a second driver, and that is the current market trends mean that 50% of the electricity bill is now made up of non-commodity costs. So what that means in effect is your pence per kilowatt hour rate. It only makes up 50% of your bill, whereas your pass-through costs such as distributed use of network charges, transmission use of network charges, those type of things are now 50% of the bill. That has driven what is now becoming the distributed energy model in the UK, where if you imagine in between now and five, ten years' time, lots of commercial buildings can actually become mini generators. And by becoming mini generators, there has to be an incentive, and those incentives are in place in the UK and they are growing all the time. So I'll come on to those in a, in a minute. But if you look at how businesses have reacted to the increase in transmission use of system charge or triad as it's otherwise known, you'll see that 3% of all of the UK demand came off last winter during those triad periods where a lot of businesses are already ahead of the game and they are switching down their energy demand during those very, very expensive periods of electricity consumption, which means they are avoiding those costs. And the way the market works at the moment is someone else has to pay those costs. And of course, that gets distributed around the people who aren't avoiding triads. So over time, as you can imagine, triads will cease at some point because you can't have half the businesses in the UK reducing their energy consumption and therefore the, the other half having to foot the bill for the way our network's been designed. So all these things will change. So flexibility will become a massive key issue for all businesses going forward. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what distributed energy is and why Centrica has, as a group, put this number one of five strategies they have to change their business going forward. Centrica are going to invest around about £700 million into distributed energy over the next five years. And that's a global business because this isn't a problem that's just happening in the UK. It's actually happening worldwide. So the solution is very much as I just mentioned, is that we will look for businesses um, and businesses will indeed need to change to become small generators where the power that's generated either takes the customers and the businesses off grid or it actually generates enough energy to put it back on the grid so if you can imagine hundreds and hundreds of small generators all around the UK all putting energy onto the grid rather than building a brand new nuclear power station or a gas fired power station which are quite uneconomical to run hence why they have not been built so as a, as, as a business we want to help customers on that journey and we want to help them generate power, become more energy efficient so they're not wasting the power they do consume, and also look at new technologies such as battery storage, which is very much going to change the UK market and help people monetize some of the existing technologies they've already installed, um, and also play in some of the very exciting new markets that are available, such as the capacity market, the fast frequency response market, and other, other markets that are available where incentivization is, is going to be the key to helping those paybacks of installing this type of equipment or doing energy efficiency projects really will help private sector businesses take those paybacks from what were five, six, seven, eight years which are unpalatable more towards the two to three year payback and also change their business and your energy costs into an energy revenue stream. And the drawing at the bottom of the slide indicates how, how that's going to be achieved by Centrica in that the building in the middle shows the typical types of things you will use. So you'll use boilers for heating and you'll use chillers for cooling and you'll have lighting. So the idea there is of course you can reduce those by putting more energy efficiency to, uh, projects into the buildings and that will save you the, 
the amount of kilowatt hours you're consuming, but also the ability to flex that and turn those on and off at certain times will give you the triad benefits and the energy savings. What will then happen is there will be a gateway to that building and hundreds of buildings in the UK which then all sit on one common platform and that common platform which we call our virtual power plant looks at the national grid and all the incentives that are out there and it pieces together all of those mini power stations which will enable availability payments, utilization payments to be taken from the national grid, from the distributed network operators and it will knit it together to look at the wholesale market which of course Centric has access to to make sure that we maximize the revenue opportunity from all our customers and as we switch them on and off the virtual power plant will capture all of those kilowatts that we're generating or taking off grid and it can reconcile those all to basically pay our customers money for doing that. We will of course look to take a share of that and we take a share of the risk as well in operating those assets. So it's a very fair way of changing the UK energy market and helping customers become part of what is the distributed energy network which the UK is evolving into. So the next slide talks about on-site generation and many, many of you I know will have done lots of on-site generation on your buildings and your estates. So this shouldn't be new to anyone. It's just a matter of how they're, they're knitted together. So as I mentioned before, about 50% of, of the cost of energy is kilowatt hours and the other 50% is through the transportation and the power plant, the transformers, the cables that get to your site. But of course, the more we can generate, and we've been doing this for lots of customers um, in the last five, six years, then it, it helps reduce those and make you more flexible. So as a business, we, we install on-site generation and we have case studies of where we've installed hundreds of megawatts of solar, biomass boilers, combined heat and power systems. We have lots of those which, we, which, which are now becoming more valuable because now we can make them flexible, which of course allows us access to those markets I just mentioned. We install energy efficiency, so we changed 12,000 light fittings last year in one NHS trust, which is really, really difficult. We do it in private sector businesses. We install inverters on pumps and fans and those type of traditional things that have been around for a long time, but, but maybe haven't had the paybacks that, that everyone has really craved for to make them a viable uh, commercial opportunity. Of course, once you've got these assets installed and you want them flexible, you need to have an operations and maintenance business. We have that so we can maintain those or control those or work with your facilities management company if that's the choice so that they can actually maintain those. And then you've got the other bits which I just mentioned and those are how do you access and monetize those, whether it be triad, network operate, op optimization, the reserve markets um, and wholesale trading. So we really have all of the tools in the toolkit to be able to knit all of these together because as the market changed and I mentioned that triad will probably change over the coming years, having those assets connected means that there will be an incentivization for a business to run those assets in particular ways in order that they can monetize those. So the opportunities are incredibly exciting. The paybacks are coming down. Wrap all of that around a great financing package that means you don't have to necessarily A, put it on your balance sheet or B, if balance sheet is an issue, you can still get very good rates of finance to install these over long periods of time which Centrica can bring all together into one exciting package. Actually gives businesses a huge opportunity to change what has been energy cost and how can we get that cost down into a revenue and profit opportunity. To summarize everything I've just said we've put together a, a short video. It highlights pretty much everything I've just said but it probably makes it a bit simpler than I've explained it so please have a look at the video and then we will move on after that. Powering the UK's homes and businesses is about balancing demand and supply. As a country we have constant energy needs but when we all want to use energy at the same time energy demand spikes. For the last 150 years, our energy supply has come from big centralised sources, power stations using coal, gas and nuclear, and more recently, renewable energy like wind farms and solar, 
all feeding into the national grid. But many of our older power stations are closing and power from renewables is intermittent, leaving a potential gap in supply. Our energy demand is also changing, with the growth of electric cars and smart technologies giving us more control over our energy use, but putting more pressure on the national grid and on our energy bills. It's why we're looking at supply and demand in a new way, using distributed energy, which holds a key to more affordable, secure and low-carbon energy. Our distributed energy and power business helps big energy consumers like businesses and hospitals to use energy more efficiently and become small-scale energy producers by installing energy efficiency measures, adding technologies like solar panels and combined heat and power, or by using their backup generators at periods of high demand. We can help them to design, install and manage these assets by connecting them to our energy control centres. From here, we can help smooth out the peaks in demand that put pressure on the network. During these spikes, our distributed energy customers can actually earn money by generating energy, reducing their consumption or delaying their energy use. We're also seeing major developments in battery storage. This will help big energy users to better manage how and when they take energy from or export it back to the grid. Distributed energy won't replace all of our large-scale power stations, but it will provide much-needed flexibility and help customers tackle the three big energy issues. Lowering bills through energy efficiency and new sources of income, ensuring a more secure energy supply and improved site resilience, and providing a low carbon energy system and energy footprint. We believe distributed energy has a vital role to play in the UK's energy mix, which is why we're investing £700 million by 2020. To find out more about how we're investing and how we can help your business take control of its energy, Go to britishgas.co.uk forward slash business forward slash DE. It's interesting to note that that energy market is changing. It will change um, going forward over the next five to ten years. The types of things that Centrica are, are doing are very exciting um, in this space and we really are a one-stop shop to go right from how does a project work and how does it get developed right through to the delivery and management of that over the next 10, 15, 20 years so that we can monetize all of that opportunity and turn that energy cost into an energy revenue opportunity for your business. Thank you very much for listening today. I hope you've all enjoyed it. And if there's any more information you would want, whether it be our supply business or our distributed energy and power business, then please do not hesitate to get in contact with the people who are detailed on that last slide. Thank you for listening. We're now going to have a question and answer session which is going to be chaired by Ralph. So at this point I'd like to hand back over to Ralph. I hope you all have a, a great day and I'll speak to you soon. Ralph? Thank you, Mike, uh, for sharing your insightful views. Uh, we've actually already received a number of questions, and I would now like to invite the audience to send any further questions in via the text facility in the question box on your control panel. Uh, so let me kick off uh, this session with a question regarding funding and commercial arrangements. Um, how does this work in your distributed model? Uh, the delegate goes on to add that although it sounds interesting, he's never had any capital for this type of project. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Ralph. Um, yeah, good question. I think it, it all depends on the circumstance of the customer. So um, clearly, with a funding option, the driver depends on whether you want cash or whether you want a good IRR, whether you want carbon savings. And with all of those three types of options, there are different funding models um, which can help you keep it off balance sheet or put it on balance sheet or have a special vehicle put together. So there are lots of different ways, and it really does depend on the, on the customer. So I'd be interested to know clearly if, if you have a specific question or you have a particular driver, it's about finding out what that is. So I'd be interested to, if, if, if the person who asked that question wants to send through their details, I'm more than happy to have a conversation about what it would look like for them. Um, but being a, an industrial commercial business, everything tends to be slightly bespoke 
Um, so yeah, there are there are lots of different options depending on your drivers. Hopefully that answers the question. Hopefully it does. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, we received another question in. Um, what happens to carbon emissions if an organisation starts to generate on-site and use backup generators? So um, the answer to this is slightly complicated, but generally, if if you have um, um, a diesel generator, clearly if we're going to run that as a diesel generator, then we have to keep a very clear eye on the balance between how much emissions that's generating compared to what you would import from the grid. Um, but what we tend to do is look at options like converting to biodiesel um, as an option because that has a lot less carbon emissions, although there are other, other, other emissions such as NOx that we need to, again, keep an eye on. But also that there's more exciting options about things like gas generators, which have much, much lower emissions, and, and then there's the renewable um, generation, which, which don't have any emissions, which are the best, um, but that they tend to be a slightly more complicated uh, longer payback model, depending on, on the type of site that people have got. So um, again, hopefully that answers the question, but carbon emissions absolutely is on the radar, and we don't want to do anything that would increase those, because that's not the aim of, of, of doing this type of project. Thanks again, Mike. Uh, questions are coming through uh, thick and fast. Uh, We've got another question here from one of the delegates. They've asked, who has control of the assets on site in the distributed energy model? So um, control of assets is an interesting one. I um, absolutely recognize that most people um, want to have some form of control because they're, they're, their sites, their estates, and they're built uh, for a reason to make sure that they can deliver the, the business that they've, they've, they've been built to do. So what we tend to do is have a joint control, so the customer will always have the last shout to say whether or not we, we should be taking stuff off grid, putting it on grid, turning demand down at certain times, or, or in fact sometimes bizarrely increasing demand to take um, to take advantage of all the different incentives that are out there. And there are so many now um, of, of different types of incentives, and they are changing um, almost almost daily. So I think the key the key is the customer will always have the last say and we almost we set our pro forma up to make sure that we we understand what the customers do's and don'ts are and we work within those parameters just like you would if you were doing an energy procurement exercise um, to make sure that every, everyone is already signed up and then we don't end up doing something that causes an issue because that clearly is not what we'd want as, as a company like Centrica. We don't want to um, put something in, promise we're going to save energy, promise we're going to generate you money and then we end up in some way um, impinging your business. So that's that's hopefully the answer to that one. I hope so. Uh, got another question here, Mike, and I say they're coming through uh, thick and fast, a little bit like the uh, football match last night. To those that watched it, we're probably going to go very much into overtime. Uh, do you think the idea of becoming on-site generators will be hindered by the end of the ROCKS support? Sorry if I mispronounced that in any way. No, I don't think it will. Um, I think Certainly, rock support um, and all, all of the, the renewable incentives um, will actually just be replaced by um, other forms of uh, income from either the DNOs or National Grid themselves. Um, actually, in, in some ways, that they're going to change, as I've said in, in the main, main presentation, that, that they'll change over time. But if you've got all your, your assets already connected to an energy control center, as they change, as those incentives change, you're going to be in a great position to, to do different things with, with those assets. But if, if, you, if you're reliant on rocks, um, then you know, it's a government incentive that can be changed and moved quite quickly, as we've seen. And then you're left with not, not a good a, an income as, as you might have thought when you did your original business case. So I think key flexibility is the key. So And I don't think that rocks going away. Certainly, we haven't seen a change in any of the, the projects we've been doing. In fact, rocks have never been on the agenda of any other type of projects we're doing because they're not just massive central generation plants. Um, so, Lovely, thanks Mike. Uh, I've got a question from somebody in Northern Ireland. The question relates to whether this uh, activity covers all of the UK, including Northern Ireland, or whether it is just uh, related to the mainland. They say presumably there may be different finance mechanisms in place, e.g. FITS, versus ROCKS or RHI, which they now believe has been removed from Northern Ireland. I don't know if you can pick that one up at all, Mike. Yes, yeah, so the distributed energy business is global. Um, so 
for every region that we're working in, um, including Northern Ireland, we are we are, we're able to, to to carry out that that work. Um, again, it just depends on what the incentives are. So clearly, in Northern Ireland, they aren't quite at the same position as as a UK national grid at the moment. But over time, that's going to happen to Northern Ireland as well as it is in the UK. Um, and and I get the point about fits and rocks, and that was probably a similar thing. Um, fits and RHI, sorry. Um, we we've seen like the solar business. We we had a really great solar business. Then the fits went, you know, pretty much overnight when we were doing some huge projects. And and lots of other businesses like ourselves have questioned how how many of those type of projects you'd want to build in the future because actually once the incentives go, you know, you're you're left high and dry, and you've got a business which which can't then um, fund itself and make itself grow. So I think I think the big difference with this is it, it isn't reliant on one government incentive. There are lots and lots of different income streams which make it um, more sustainable over a longer period of time. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I've got one final question. Uh, this relates to an organisation that has installed some solar power already. Their question is, can distributed energy work even though they, have, they already generate some of their own power? So absolutely yes. In fact, if they've got solar already, um, we will probably find that, depending on when it was installed, there are opportunities to enhance the performance of that solar now with the technologies that have come in, and also add things like battery storage to it. Because generally, if the sun is shining, sometimes it's not shining at the right highest. You know, in the red bands, dual bands, uh, that's on the incoming supply. Then absolutely, um, they are. They are perfect for adding in extra products and doing some optimization. And, and clearly, depending on how big your solar array is, there's still there's still opportunities to do other things, whether it be energy efficiency, um, and actually make even more of of the solar generation you've got, um, and and add generation of, of other types such as you know gas gas um, powered backup generators, those type of things. Um, so yes, plenty of opportunity. I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's the end of the journey if there's some solar installed, no matter how big it is. Thanks, Mike. We're going to wrap up the session now. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us today. Please be reassured, if your question has not been answered, it will be forwarded to the team at British Gas following this event. Over the next few days, you will re receive an email with a link to a full recording of today's event, so please feel free to forward this to your colleagues. I'd also like to remind you that you can download a copy of the survey report I mentioned earlier from the handout section on the control panel. If you would like to speak to the team at British Gas, please do drop us a line at inquiries at exactlive.co.uk and we will put you in touch with the most appropriate person. Hope you all have a great day and goodbye for now.